My sister Stephanie loves photography. She's always taking pictures everywhere, and she's really got a good eye. I said, we should go up to those natural hunting blinds outside of town and take some pictures. She agreed, and I was stoked because we could hike a little bit and spend some time together. That Saturday, we met up and got on the road. The hunting blinds were about 30 minutes out of town, and we talked the whole ride. When we arrived, we got out and started hiking. We were about halfway up when Stephanie saw something she liked and took her camera out. Shit, she said. I don't have my SD card. She had left it at home. Oh well, I replied. The pictures weren't really the point of this anyways. We explored the area for a bit, maybe 30 minutes, before heading back to the car. On our way back, she said, hey, wanna go see an abandoned house? Not having anything else planned for the rest of the evening, I said, sure, where is it? It was about halfway home. I turned onto the desolate dirt road and could see the house in the distance. We got there and got out. The house was old. Most of the windows had plywood over them. Next to the house was another house that had burned down. We walked around, guessing where the bathrooms and bedrooms used to be, based on the layout and size of each one. I turned my attention back to the main house. So are we gonna go in or what? She accepted the challenge and said with a grin, Yeah, I'm waiting on you. We walked up to the doorway and looked inside. The door had been ripped off. It was still pretty light outside, but due to the blocked windows, it was pretty dark in the house. I walked inside and she followed. People had fucked this place up. There was broken glass and trash all over. There was even some old furniture left, and it was destroyed as well. There was graffiti and holes punched and kicked all over the walls. We cautiously went through the house, and while I was acting all not scared in front of my sister, I was a little nervous. Scenes from scary movies were running through my head, and I was trying to tell myself to stop being ridiculous, thinking stuff like that. Right at that moment, I heard a faint sound, like chains clinking. Shh, I whispered. We stopped our crunching feet and stared at each other. After a few seconds, it happened again. It was coming from one of the closed doors in the hall. Our eyes widened and Stephanie quietly said, let's go see what it is. Are you crazy, I said, why? She smiled. Come on, are you scared? She was daring me, and I wasn't about to chicken out. We crept towards the door, trying to be as quiet as we could, but we were still making noise. There's no way we couldn't. I grabbed the doorknob and turned it all the way before flinging the door open. We stood there in shock, seeing what was in the room. A skinny man wearing dirty pants was hanging from the ceiling by hooks in his back. Like Chris Angel's shit. He was staring at us. His pulled skin made it look like there were tents on his back. He started to swing himself from side to side and started laughing. <coughs> laughing like someone from an insane asylum would laugh. We finally snapped out of it and got the hell out of there fumbling through the trash and debris. We got to the car and jumped in. He was still laughing. We sped off and I didn't calm down until I got home. We still talk to each other about it. I'm sure we will for the rest of our lives. A little backstory. When I was younger, around 12, my family and I used to live in this nice suburb that was only a few years old. Our house was up on a hill that turned into forest a way back. At the edge of that forest was a run-down two-story house with no one living in it. Full-on smashed windows, hole in the roof, completely unlivable. It turned into one of those haunted myths that kids in the neighborhood would talk about. Most kids were told by their parents not to mess around with it, 
since it was unsafe and falling apart, but kids will be kids. On to the story. One day some of my friends and I were bored and walking around the neighborhood, but couldn't find anything to do. I was and continue to be a fan of exploring rundown buildings and areas. Plus I am kind of a horror slash ghost nut. So I suggested we go look around the house. My two other friends, let's call them Don and John, couldn't think of anything else to do so we ended up going to check out the house. Now the inside of the house is wrecked. Pieces of the ceiling are gone. Furniture is still just sitting around and it really seems like that house was just straight up abandoned, which obviously fed our imaginations. There was even an old rusty knife in the kitchen sink, straight out of a movie shit. We end up looking around the first floor, standing at the door. There is a set of stairs right in front of you to the second floor, a kitchen to the right that turns into a dining room towards the back corner. On the left was a small hallway, with a bathroom under where the stairs would be. Continue on and there is a living room that turns into another sitting room next to the front door. Not a big house at all, but like I said, with a good bit of furniture still around, it fed the creep factor. We explored the first floor for a few minutes before meeting up by the door again, where I then suggested we go upstairs. Don and John didn't want to go up, since the stairs looked to be in bad shape, so I went up on my own while they waited outside. I gingerly made my way up the stairs, making sure to test them before putting my full weight on them. At the top, there were two doorways, one to either side. On the left was what looked like a bedroom, so I looked inside, but it was pretty normal. Besides the wallpaper being messed up and various planks of wood being strewn about, there was nothing spectacular about the room. There was a fairly big bed, a small vanity in the corner, and a dresser. With nothing going on there, I decided to check the other room. It looked to be a bathroom. When I looked inside, I saw a large hole in the middle of the room, with part of the wall gone, so you could see up the street a ways. Now let me also preface this with, I'm not really the king of good decisions here. I'm in an abandoned house that's falling apart on the second floor, looking for creepy stuff. The hole is also right above the kitchen, so we would and should have noticed anyone there. So I realize now that I should have immediately found this to be sketchy. Right next to the hole, sitting in a chair facing away from me, is a girl with longish black hair and a white nightgown not reacting to the noise I'm making as I'm moving around. With my glorious decision-making abilities, I said, Oh, hi there. Are you looking around the house too? No response. Hello? No response again. Um, are you okay? With this, I started moving towards her with my hand out, like I'm about to tap her shoulder. Finally, maybe two inches away from tapping her, it hits me. The weirdness of the whole situation. Then my body immediately goes into fight or flight mode and a voice is screaming in my head, not to touch this girl. The fear I felt was incredibly intense, but I knew I couldn't take my eyes off of her. Slowly, I backed out of the room without looking away from her back. Once I was out and next to the stairs, I bounded down the stairway and out the door as quickly as I could. My friends asked me what happened, but they didn't believe me when I told them, which was honestly no surprise. I was still curious about her though, so I walked up the street to where you could see the hole in the wall, but saw nothing. She wasn't there, so I was definitely creeped out. We ended up just going back home after that because there wasn't much else to do. The house ended up being demolished a year later to make room for new housing. Okay, so on Friday, June 6th of 2008, I took a day off of work to go on a solo backpacking trip up near Mount Adams in Oregon for two nights. 
This is something that I used to do every few months, because there is nothing that can clear your mind like a few nights alone out in nature. It started off like all the other trips. I hiked in from one of the trails that ran through the area, headed out to an area that I selected that was far enough from a trail to not see other people, but close enough to make it back easily in the off chance that something happened. Yes, I know that a lot of people caution hikers and campers about going alone, but I loved the solitude. I reached my destination midday on Friday and set up my little camp. I foraged around for some prime sticks to whittle on. It was a solitary paradise until the sun set and it became dark. That's when I knew something was weird. You know that feeling you get when you're being watched? Well, mine was high alert. All I knew is that something felt wrong and my heart would not stop pounding. I don't know how to describe it in any other way than I felt like prey, like I was being hunted. I had never felt this before on any of my trips out here, so I was a little bit freaked out but tried to just brush it off as just stress carrying over from work. Now by this time, I had my little fire going, but it was small because I was technically not allowed to be camping there, let alone have a campfire. I decided that I wanted to start piling wood on because I needed to make sure I could see and ward off anything that was getting an idea of visiting me. The only problem was I didn't have enough wood for a big fire because I was only planning on a small one with twigs and small branches. This is when I made my mistake. I pulled out my battery-powered lantern and set it near the fire for some more light. As I went a few feet around my little camping zone, looking for more sticks, I should have taken it with me. There was almost no moon at all that night, so anything that was not touched by my campfire or lantern was pitch black. As I was grabbing some small branches on the outer edge of my light, I felt something slam into the back of my thigh so hard that it spun me about and threw me to the ground. The pain was horrible. Once my adrenaline caught up to the situation, it helped settle it a bit, but it felt like my leg was on fire. I landed on a rock that was not there a moment before and I began looking around for who threw it at me. But because of the way I had fallen, I was in the shade of my tent. Before I could hobble around my tent to grab my lantern, I heard this weird scraping sound on the ground and saw a little cloud of dust start coming my way. Whoever had thrown the rock at me had evidently kicked dirt onto my little fire, and now it was going out and I only had the light for my lantern which wasn't super bright to begin with. I started shouting something at this point, but I don't remember what I said, just that it was colorful and with a number of threats attached. I got to my feet, hobbled to my little lantern, and pulled the machete out of its little sheath on my belt. I stood there shining the light in all directions around me, looking and yelling for whatever it was to come out, but nobody did. I must have stood there for a good half hour. I didn't know what else to do and my leg was really starting to hurt again, so I decided I would just go into my tent and sit there listening. It was eerily quiet, no woods noises, no animals, nothing. So I just sat there holding my lantern and waited for what must have been hours. I finally felt like I could let my guard down so I turned off my light and let my eyes adjust. My tent door was partially unzipped so I could see out. There was nothing but that too quiet sound while my eyes were starting to pick up shapes of the last of the embers from my dead little fire. That's when something grabbed my foot through the door of the tent and dragged me out. It felt like a vice just grabbed my ankle and started hauling me through the brush. I thrashed and screamed and tried to grab anything that was there, but I was too disoriented. I thought I was dead for sure, bear attack. Dinner time and I was the meal. 
but then suddenly I was free. I turned and started scrambling for my tent as fast as I could. I looked behind me, but I couldn't see a thing. But whatever dragged me had taken me a good 10 to 12 feet from my tent in just a few seconds. I grabbed my light and machete and went back to my standing defense, but nothing happened. Not for the rest of the night. I crouched down and eventually sat there for the last few hours of darkness, but I never let my guard down. Eventually, the noises of the woods returned and the sky started to get a little brighter, so I packed up my stuff and hauled ass out of those woods as fast as I could. I have no idea what or who it was that dragged me around like a toy, but I will never be going back to find out, that's for sure. And no, I'm not saying that this is Bigfoot or that I believe in him. I know there have been a number of sightings in this area over the years, but I didn't see any footprints or anything when I was packing my stuff up. But something is out there. That I know. When I was young, I was prone to fevers and nightmares, something that my doctors and my parents alike put down to a weak constitution and an overactive imagination. Even after I grew older and stronger, nightmares continued to plague me, nightmares that no drug could keep at bay, nightmares that frequently had me lashing out violently as I awoke. As you can imagine, when it came time for me to attend the university, I felt I had no choice but to live alone. The lack of companionship only aided my focus on all things academic. My grades were strong, and my instructors began to take special interest in my academic progress. Unfortunately, in my second year of studies, I began to experience incidents of sleepwalking and nocturnal violence. On four separate occasions, campus security had to apprehend me. This is how I came to the attention of Dr. Palatine, the university's leading expert on the subject of sleep disorders. Perhaps it would be more appropriate to say I was placed under her care and supervision. She was a pretty woman with iron gray hair that was streaked with red. She wore thick glasses and spoke with an Eastern European accent. Dr. Palatine explained to me that she had just returned from a long sabbatical where she had been conducting what she calls the purest research. She shared her theories with me about the nature of REM sleep and the source of dream imagery in the collective unconscious. She requested I keep a journal and a tape recorder at my bedside, but I must admit that the nature of my waking terrors left me with little clear or consistent information to impart. This lack of hard data to work from led her to invite me to live with her. I felt I had no choice but to accept. Dr. Palatine lived in a crumbling brownstone several miles from the college campus. She made a room for me in her basement so that my night terrors could be controlled and monitored with the greatest care. My first night and last night of observation began the ordeal that consumed my life. Dr. Palatine gave me a mild sedative and had me lie down on the cot she had prepared for me. She sat beside me in an uncomfortable looking rust colored chair, pen and notepad in hand. Soon I was asleep and soon I found myself in the most lucid dream I had ever known. In the dream, I found myself alone in the basement, staring up at the single bare light bulb that was the only illumination. Dr. Palatine and the rust colored chair were gone. A strange feeling of dislocation washed over me as I stood and walked up the basement stairs. I found the cellar door had been locked from the outside, but I felt no panic at this realization. What better way to curtail my nightly meanderings than a locked door? I rapped on the door and called for Dr. Palatine. When there was no answer, I began to knock louder and louder. I called her name over and over, but there was no answer. The feeling of dislocation grew stronger, and in my mind's eye, I saw myself beating at the door in ever-growing panic. I looked so small, like a forgotten child. 
Without warning, the basement door rattled on its hinges as though something had been thrown against it. Fingers scrabbled and grabbed through the inch-wide gap between the bottom of the doorframe and the floor. They were thin and covered with thick tufts of red hair. They scratched and scraped. Even now, you might assume that this was all some sophomoric prank, but my every sense told me this was not the case. Whatever was on the other side of that door was bestial and twisted. The grasping of the fingers became more frantic, as though it were searching for something precious that was just out of reach. It was as though my every childhood nightmare was coming true. Hadn't the fear of seeing this very personal incubus driven me to night terrors and fugues? I screamed at it. The claw-like hand retreated. There was a moment when I thought it was about to retreat, but then it began to sing. I cannot describe that voice. I don't know if that voice can be described. All I can say is that the sound that reached my ears was a loathsome crooning. An image arose to my mind, that of the creature burbling nonsense, trying to lull the pink, quivering shape at its breast to sleep. Desperate to escape that sound, I backed away only to lose my footing. I tumbled down the stairs, striking my head and plunging my mind into merciful, mindless darkness. How long was it until I woke again? I cannot say, but I do know that I blinked my eyes to see the basement door wide open. It took me some time to find the courage to mount the stairs, but when I did, I found myself in a barren house. Of Dr. Palatine, there was no trace. Not only had she disappeared from her home, she had also vanished from all university records. All my professors insisted there was no Dr. Palatine. There had never been a Dr. Palatine. The more I told my story, the more I became a subject of derision and unease. I left the university in the middle of the semester, never to return. I found gainful employment far away from the university, but I had lost the capacity to dream and with it I had lost all sense of certainty in the world around me. I began to fear that I no longer dreamt, because I was still asleep in Dr. Palatine's basement, that I had never awoken at all. Hey guys and ladies, thanks for watching. We got 250 subscribers, Ripley. So to celebrate, we have a special guest. Hey man, how's it going? What's going on? Not much. Just finishing this video up, did you like it? Yeah, on a scale one to five. This is off the charts. This is a five plus. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Are you going to say hi to Ripley? <laughs> All right. So what else has been going oh, Whoa. Did you have that cheeseburger in your pocket? Yeah. No. Mm. Mm. Yeah. God damn, bro, is it really that good? Mm hmm. I say, is it really that good? Mm hmm. Never mind. <laughs> Man, you straight up killed that cheeseburger, dude. Yeah, so good. All right, well, before we wrap this thing up, do you want to say anything to the people? Yeah. I found a napkin. Okay, you found a napkin. <laughs> anything else? Yeah. Share, like, subscribe. Tell everybody about this video. Oh, uh, you don't have to do that, man. I mean, if they enjoy the content, they'll do that on their own. Tell a friend about this video. Dude, what I just say? <laughs> Real quick before we go, do you think you could... Fart and try to cover it up with crazy noises? Yeah. How's that? Nice. Success. Well, listen, man. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you so much. Be good to animals, even people. See ya. 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 Plus, I am kind of a ghost horror nut. 